Hey everybody and welcome to the latest video here on the Inside Oaks YouTube channel. My name is Kenny McIntosh and this is an exclusive conference call that we were a part of yesterday with WWE Champion Drew McIntyre. It is a great talk with Drew, with myself and some other journalists who were asking him questions about advice from Mick Foley, what it was like facing off against The Undertaker in that tag match. That was my question. It's second in. You'll like what he's got to say. And um, he talks about dream opponents. He talks about Lashley. He talks about getting fired. He talks about coming back. There's loads of stuff. So we hope you enjoy it. And as always, give it a thumbs up if you like it. And uh, remember to check out all of our other videos. Hi, Drew. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I want to take you on the quickest trip down memory lane before I ask my question, if that's okay. About okay. five years ago, uh, shortly after you were released from WWE, I remember um, you were in a certain rock club in Glasgow watching WrestleMania 31 on the big screen with a load of uh, a load of us. And five years later, on the stage, essentially, that we were watching that night, you won the big one. You won the WWE Championship. But my favourite thing about the Drew McIntyre that we're seeing right now is how much freedom you seem to have. Um, it seems like it's just you going out there. I don't know if it's a compliment or an insult, but it seems like you're just going out there and naturally being yourself. Um, who is to thank for that? Have you got, you know, what kind of influences likes of Paul Heyman, Triple H or Vince McMahon had on that? Or is it just all you being yourself? I mean, inevitably, um, you know, it comes down to it's a man being, you know, cool with everything. And if it's working, he's going to be cool with it. I think like a Paul Heyman knows uh, exactly who I am, what I'm capable of and what I was doing outside of the company and was maybe looking for that opportunity to let me be myself, to allow Mr. McMahon to see that. And as well, as well as a writing team, well, you know, they follow the stuff outside the company. It was great people we worked with. Um, but that's the cool thing about right now, aside from watching the WrestleMania and the Cat House all those years ago and actually being in the main event. WrestleMania is pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, I, I can't pinpoint it exactly. Uh, but Paul Heyman reminded me recently that there was a particular promo I did. There was a dark match after Rod finished. It was a cage match. They basically said, go buy some time. I went out, sat in the barricade, and I was just myself. I was Drew Galloway. Um, I interacted with the crowd, and I remember fans stopping and turning around and walking back down because I was just having fun, being silly, being the real Drew, being sarcastic, telling jokes that aren't funny half the time. And that's the real me. But when the bell rings, they always know I'm going to kick butt. And I guess that's part of my charm is that I'm a bit goofy and a bit silly at times. Uh, but when it comes down to it, I will kick your butt and I've got a relatable story. So it is really cool to be the real me. And like you say, if you looked at the pieces of paper that say words on them before I go out there, I'd be shocked if you found four um, <laughs> that actually come out on television. Because uh, I, I just speak right from the heart. You know, it comes from Drew. I am Drew. I know Drew because I'm the real Drew. And I get that guidance from people around me um, to keep bringing the world Drew. And hopefully it resonates with everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you, bud. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Kenny, let's come to you next. Hey, Drew, how's it going? Good, Kenny. How are you, buddy? I'm good, I'm good. Um, so my question, I, I want to ask you, everybody's talking about The Last Ride and they're watching the documentary series, and I kind of got to thinking, because you'd said to BT Sport, you know, you were originally going to face Taker at WrestleMania 26. That was one of the ideas. And then nine years later, you know, Taker has this match with Goldberg that goes, in his own words, really badly. And then less than a month later, or just more than a month later, you're in a tag match with Undertaker. Um, it's a big pressure situation. Can you take us back to that situation? How do you find out you're in the match? And talk us through that day with all that was kind of on the line. Um, I think I found out I was in the match, you know, close to the last minute. I remember when Taker came back, it was one of the few surprises in wrestling because um, it's so hard to keep a secret with social media these days. I mean, we managed to get right up to Taker um, appearing. The lights went out when we're about to give the coast to coast to Roman. I was holding Roman in the corner. The lights went out, reappeared, came on, and Taker was standing right there. And the reaction around the build and the reaction of social media was that of pure shock. So for a start, I was proud that we actually kept a secret for once. And building up to the match, you know, myself, Shane, and Roman were very adamant that you know, we're going to give him a match he deserves after that last match and they didn't go particularly well and in my head I was thinking you know this has been coming a long time for myself I don't know how many matches he's got left in him I got a few things on my list I really want to accomplish now that I'm back in WWE number one was become champion got that right here um, and up there was getting that big singles match with The Undertaker 
and I'm all about moments these days rather than just necessarily the moves in there. The moves are cool. It's good to have a good match, but it's all about the story in those moments. And I suggested to take her, I don't know if you'll remember, the one point we came face to face in the match and he was cool with that and I could hear the crowd rumbling and then at the very end for the finish, we did the throw it slash and I appeared up behind him. You know, that was a couple of cool moments. We had that match. I received you know, really well. He was very happy with it and I might have dropped into conversation. You know, it was a certain match we're hoping to have about 10 years ago now that we've been in there together <laughs> and you know uh, kind of what I'm capable of these days and you know the way I think these days uh, you know I think he seemed pretty keen that we could do something down the line and fingers crossed uh, that match happens because I really think we do something special great thanks thank you buddy cool we're going to come to uh, Andy Spores we'll come to you next Hi Drew, thanks for taking the time to speak to us. Um, you've been very vocal in flying the flag as being the first ever British WWE champion. Um, my question would be, who do you think could become the second in the future? Hmm. I've not even thought about it. I'm so concerned about staying the first British champion for the next 20 years if possible. Um, <laughs> I reckon like Pete Dunne is obviously uh, doing a great job um, thus far. So everybody has NXT UK and their British superstars over here. I'm just amazed by the representation we have these days. Uh, I reckon Pete, uh, you know, he gets a good response from the crowd. He is very good in the ring. He's incredibly young. I think he's going to have a good shot at being number two. But don't be surprised if someone else jumps in there also because there's so much talent. Awesome. Uh, we're going to come over to uh, Tony Kwan next. Hi, Drew. Ho hope you're well. Um, oh, I understand it's understand it's someone's birthday next Saturday. So, so my question is: How does WWE champion spend his his birthday? And if he was to if he was to only get one gift, what would that be, and why? Um, if uh, R-Truth and Rey Mysterio could tell me where the fountain of youth is so I can go swimming around in it and start aging backwards like them that'd be cool <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah I'm coming up my uh, 35th birthday which is crazy I mean yeah, people do think I'm older than I actually am everyone thinks I'm in my, my like, real late 30s early 40s I've been around for so long it's just crazy to me uh, that I've been in America for so long now, coming up for 13 years. I spoke to Dave Kapoor, one of our writers backstage um, at Raw the other day, and I told him you did my first ever backstage pre-take when I was talking about getting dual citizenship. And I was uh, 22 at the time, and I'm coming up for 35. So it's been mental. But yeah, I'll be hoping that the Ray and Truth reveal the, the secret for the Fountain of Youth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope you have a good birthday anyway. Just well. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we're going to come over to Paul. Paul Witcherly, over to you next. Hi, Drew. How you doing, bud? Fantastic. It's really weird because I'm seeing like a mini me in the corner and then I've got a giant me in the middle. It's like I'm talking to myself the whole time. <laughs> you all have just voices in my head. <laughs> <laughs> We'll try not to confuse you that often. Then. <laughs> uh, right. The, my question is, uh, with the current uh, public health crisis going on, how much harder has it been for wrestlers to really tell their story in the ring with no fans? I mean, obviously, the fans are our number one superstar. They create the atmosphere. Uh, but, you know, WWE is all about innovating. And I me mean, personally, I'm all about innovating and thinking outside of the box. Um, I think from a match perspective, you really got to think about it and change it up and maybe don't sit on those slow holds for too long and try and keep the pace going. Um, I will also try to tell your story at the same time. So match-wise, definitely, there's required a lot more thinking. And I hit harder because you can hear all the strikes. And I already hit hard to begin with. But from the promo-wise, I think it's a very good time if you know your character and um, to get your... Um, character out there and have people invested in you and 
you know, WWE is hard. It's all about storytelling and characters. And I think with the attention fully on you, with like nobody shouting over you, the spotlights on you, if you're able to really embrace that character, you know who you are. You're able to educate everybody exactly who you are. By the time the crowds come back, they're going to be care about you a lot more. And I think people should really be taking advantage of this time right now to get those characters over. We'll figure it out, um, you know, what's the best way to go about the matches to make it, you know, more exciting for the viewers at home without that um, atmosphere. That's great. And the, the last one I was going to uh, say was uh, you won the title against a, a cage fighter. You've had a lot of good competition uh, so far and defended the title very bravely. But up next is Bobby Lashley, another fighter. Will this be just as tough as Brock Lesnar or even harder? Um, I don't get paid by the hour, so hopefully I can beat him in five minutes too. But uh, yeah, Lashley's you know more focused than he's ever been. He's a huge guy, a strong guy, a fast guy. He's undefeated, uh, like you say, in the MMA world in Bellator, and he's the kind of Lashley that I've been hoping to see on WWE TV. You know, this soap opera uh, wedding stuff uh, is for some people. It's not for me. I, you know, the show should be you know a lot of. Um, you know, different entertaining things for everybody. But Bobby Lashley is not that. He's a killer. And the partnership with MVP and Lashley is exactly the perfect pairing to bring out the real Lashley. He's been on a different level these past few weeks. I felt it on Monday when we're brawling with each other. I don't know how anybody's been in the cage with that man. Um, and I know at Backlash, if Edge and Randy Orton are going to have the greatest match. Sorry, sorry, let me get it right. Edge and Randy Orton are going to have the greatest wrestling match <laughs> ever. Then Bobby Lashley and Drew McIntyre are going to have the greatest fight ever. Uh, Leanne, we're going to come over to you next. Leanne. Okay, hi, Drew. Uh, Leanne Marie from Wrestling. Um, so the last time we were able to really get together as a crowd with our friends to watch you was the Royal Rumble. And I actually hosted the Hooked On Party in Leeds for that event. And it was absolutely deafening when you won the Rumble. Um, but what I want to ask you is, in terms of proudest moments of your career, where does seeing the crowd's reaction at the Glasgow Hooked On Wrestling Party rank for you that's when the crowd went absolutely crazy the video of course went viral um over your royal rumble win and also on, to follow up from that how did it compare with the crowd reaction in the stadium i mean it, it was much the same i guess in a more compact environment you know scottish people can be amazingly loud and like you say it wasn't just in scotland i saw videos uh, from england from america from canada from all over the world just that particular video went viral and the UK videos, you don't see a reaction like that unless it's like a cup final and somebody scores a winning goal in the very last minute is where you see that kind of reaction. And the idea that it was for me and uh, winning the Royal Rumble is just incredible um, to even can imagine it never mind it actually happening. So that was you know, very, very special to me. And the fact I was in the arena and, you know, obviously the Brock Lesnar uh, elimination was, um, completely deafening. I always liken this, uh, you know, before I walked out there to, I don't know if you've, some of you all have seen the movie A Star Is Born, like uh, right before Lady Gaga walks on stage to sing the song and she's thinking to herself, right, it's now or never. I've always heard potential, potential, potential. I'm going to be the future for my entire career. And I was like, man, I need to be the now. When I walked out there to that ring, that was my walking on the stage moment from A Star Is Born. And to hear the crowd react the way they did for the elimination of Lesnar, and then going right through the rumble, I am eliminating you know, six people, but also knowing the edge is coming out and the crowd have turned on people before when they don't get the winner they want. And he was out right before Roman, right before the end. They could have turned the fact they didn't. And when I eliminated Roman, reacted just as loud as a Lesnar elimination meant the world to me. Because I'm used to being booed in WWE, so it's pretty crazy. Uh, Jerry at Sports Matters. We'll come to you next, Jerry. Oh yeah, Drew Hostings, my man. Hope all is well. Fabulous, buddy. So just have to ask you, Drew, we have to uh, rewind uh, many years ago to your time in Ireland with Irish Whip Wrestling. Uh, can you tell us some stories and obviously uh, the success you had there? Obviously, it was good times. 
Yeah, it was great times. Um, you know, that's back in the infant stages of, uh, you know, European wrestling. We just really didn't have anywhere to learn as such. There was all-star wrestling was the only full-time place um, in the whole of Europe uh, where I worked as often as I could, especially during the summer. But during that period, like myself and Seamus um, would travel around Scotland, England and Ireland. He would take his video camera, we'd record the matches and we're basically trying to teach ourselves and help each other out. How can we get better? And Irish Whip had the only television show um, on the wrestling channel. So we were on that, which gave us some TV experience. Although half the time we're doing our interviews, we didn't realize you're supposed to talk towards the hard camera here. We do most of our interviews like this. Okay, everybody. Uh, so the people over here were having a great time, but the people at home had no idea <laughs> what was going on with our, our faces because we talked for the back of our heads. But that was a great time, great learning experience. Like, I was like 19 at the time. Seamus was about 37. Joking. <laughs> um, and we had some really fun times as well, uh, inside and outside the ring, that I can't talk about. Good man. And I just have to ask you quickly, Drew, uh, Jinder Mahal, obviously a good friend of yours. Is it possible that we could see a showdown maybe at WrestleMania 37? Yeah, I think there should uh, be a showdown, be it a WrestleMania or um, any pay-per-view, as long as there's the appropriate build and appropriate story told uh, for the fans to invest. It's not just that we're both in 3MB. There's so much more to it than that. There's what happened in the ring and especially what happened out of the ring that people don't know about and our personal and private lives and what was going on at the time, especially with me. And he was there the whole time and we both getting fired. And then uh, me, you know, trying to get out there on the independence and make my name. And he went off and really kind of gave up, stopped working out and turned his life around, came back to WWE, became WWE champion before me. Wasn't exactly as universally praised as when I finally won the WWE championship. So there's so many possible you know, layers to the story that the world have seen on television and have not seen that could really make for like, one of the most memorable feuds of all time. We have so much material. Uh, Louis Dangle. I was about to call you Louis Danger, which I feel like could be your new name. Louis Dangle. We're going to come over like to you. Louis Danger. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what my boss tried to call me, trying to get it over on YouTube, but I've told him, no, it's Dangle, so we're going with that. How are you, Drew? Uh, I'm good, Danger. Good to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've seen, obviously, you have some great matches with Andrade, Seth, Murphy, even Big Show, Lesnar over the past few weeks, and even Corbin from SmackDown. Who are some people that you haven't been in the ring with yet that you'd like to, perhaps even from NXT, if the possibility of sort of a matchup with someone down there came about? Hmm. I mean, the number one... I guess I always say is AJ Styles. It happened again. I don't know what the deal is with him and I. We're always like ships in the night and we keep missing each other. Be it um, away from WWE, go towards Impact Wrestling, he's going out, we're booking the same independent shows. It can't quite work out. Or he's on and hey, I'm off, I'm off, on, he's off. He comes back to WWE, I come back to WWE. We're both on Raw, but hey, we're both bad guys. Finally, I'm a good guy, he's a bad guy. It's going to happen. He disappears to smack then. So I guess we'll have to wait for that match still. Nonetheless, um, yeah, that's up there. And if I'm going to pick anyone from NXT, there's so many. Yeah, I feel like Adam Cole and I have more to finish. Like uh, when I won the NXT Championship, Adam Cole and Undisputed Era debuted. They attacked me. They had the crowd chant Adam Cole, babies. I lay there with the title and stole my moment. I did get a little bit of retribution when it was myself versus Cole with Shawn Michaels as the ref, which was a funny graphic before Shawn cut his hair. It was myself and Cole with Shawn in the middle, and it looked like a dad refereeing a fight between the big brother and the little brother or something. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but I feel like there's more to that um, when Cole uh, probably shows up on Raw or SmackDown. And then I'll have to use the brand, the brand invitation, but I'll go kick his butt somewhere. But both of those are in extremely interesting uh, prospects. I know you spoke quite heavily about wanting a UK pay-per-view. If Vince said to you, listen, Drew, you've got the book for this one, you main event, who are you facing? Is it a AJ or, or Cole, or is it a UK-based wrestler that you'd like to face at that pay-per-view? That's a good question. I would just be so excited to have the UK pay-per-view. I just never shut up about it. I shout it from the rooftops every time I can, because the UK deserves 
a pay-per-view the level of SummerSlam 92. I know it would sell out. I know it would do incredible. I know it would be such huge news. I don't understand the logistics. It would have happened if it was that easy, but we absolutely can and will make it happen. Again, I will wrestle anybody on our... I've said it before. I'll wrestle anyone on our roster and I'll wrestle anyone not on our roster. Um, I've been having this back and forth with Tyson Fury and he just... Uh, his latest comment said, you know, he's deadly serious about having a fight with myself, you know, be it over here or be it in the UK. And if it took myself versus a Fury and a Battle of Britain to get the non-wrestling eyes, you know, on the WWE product, then I would absolutely do that. But basically, I would do whatever it took to have that pay-per-view. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. We're going to come over to Daniel Wood at The Sportster. Hello. Um, the question I wanted to ask was that obviously you are the uh, champion at the moment and you've had a massive journey to get there from being fired from WWE uh, to then working on the indies and getting your way back into the company. Um, there were lots of wrestlers that were released uh, kind of over the last few months uh, due to the coronavirus crisis. What is your advice to them, uh, having been someone that was fired but now finds themselves kind of as the face of the company? I mean, I've been speaking uh, to a few of them. And then anyone I've not spoken to that hears this, feel free to reach out to me, please. Um, but this is, you know, the opportunity to really reinvent yourself. And if you had a vision of yourself that you weren't able to bring to the table in WWE, obviously WWE, the machine's constantly moving. It's very difficult to reinvent yourself within the system. And I couldn't have been who I am today without my time away. I wouldn't have learned what I've learned without my time away. So I'd say just have a look at yourself, be honest. Like, who am I? What do I want to show the world? And put that plan together right now, you know, during this time, because the world is going to open up and the independent scene is the healthiest it's been in, I'd say, ever, to be honest. Like, um, just the level of talent around the world, incredible companies around the world. And if you have something to bring to the table and you are truly good at your job, you truly love this job, you're going to have the best time. You are going to make money. You're going to make a lot of fans. And eventually, if you choose to, you'll probably be back in WWE. Um, so if you believe in yourself the way I believed in myself, go out, have that fun, learn those lessons, get better, whatever your weak areas are. And one day you could be sitting there with the WWE Championship. Let me turn it around the right way. There we go. <laughs> We're going to come over next to uh, Daniel McIver. Go ahead, Daniel. I do. Good to hear you doing well. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so many people being in Scotland have come up to me who aren't wrestling fans and go, did you hear that a guy from Ayr has just won the WWE Champion? And it's been so interesting to see so many non-wrestling fans in Scotland become aware of you and see your work. How does it feel that you've almost transcended the professional wrestling scope in Scotland and taken over kind of the mainstream media as well? Everything about this uh, blows my mind. Um, you know, I try to keep the level head on. You know, I'm still, I'm just, you know, the big wrestling fan who just um, pursued it and went this far. And I'm still a fan at heart. But it's just bizarre to see, like, the night after I won the WWE Championship, the headlines of BBC for the whole of the UK was the Queen making a speech and Drew McIntyre wins the WWE title. And I believe I was ahead of her. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of the time for like news back home and it's absolutely surreal to me but again I've got to put my you know professional hat on at the same time and say this is what I've been working for my whole life I've been looking to become WWE champion I'm doing it and I'm getting to be myself and tell my real story and um, I'm the brand ambassador of WWE my job is to put more eyes on the product especially outside you know, we've got our fans are going to be passionate with us no matter what happens but we've got to get those outside eyes on the product we've got to keep growing the product and the fact that it's happening back home in the UK is amazing. And that's why I go after like the Tyson Furies and the Colby Covingtons from UFC and the Chris Suttons back home. And we have that banter back and forth and, you know, they all get it. They get WWE's global uh, reach, you know, 800 million homes, 180 different countries, 28 different languages, over a billion with a B social media followers. And they're all entertainers, but that's my job. It's to put those extra eyes in the product, but every time it happens and I see a mainstream story in America or back home in the UK, I do have to sit back and go, this is mental. What is going on right now? <laughs> Can't believe this. Thanks very much, man. Thanks for that. We're going to come next to uh, KJ 
from Roped In. Hi, Drew. Nice to speak to you hey, again. Uh, Drew, when you made your Raw return in the April of uh, 2018, you cut a very passionate promo about um, coming back to a locker room that had gone soft, people with no fire, no ambition, and you were the wake-up call and reality check that WWE desperately needed. Um, that promo resonated emphatically with the audience because you know, there seemed to be some truth behind it, and it was what a lot of the fans were thinking. Um, could you explain some words if that situation has changed perhaps uh, since your you know re-debut till now yeah i mean when i said that i'm not talking about everybody obviously um, i just see a few people that reminded me of myself during my first run and i get it i understand but i look back at that time and i thought man like i wish somebody had gave me a shake and a real wake-up call during that period and i figured it out within the system i loved everything i did outside the company but the fact that I was just sitting there and woe is me rather than working as hard as I could to get better. Like, like uh, I can't change it. And I am who I am today because of that um, journey. Um, but yeah, things, things have changed. Like people work so hard uh, right now, especially the situation that's going on. Um, I can't say that everyone's not pulling their weight. I go there with such a limited crew, obviously with the CDC guidelines everybody's working extra hours working their butt off for the company and hopefully they're seeing you know what i'm doing as champion you know there's not enough i can do i'm always asking for extra interviews i'm always trying to get more eyes on the product i meant everything i say that i'm gonna like whatever john cena did that work ethic i want to surpass that that's my mindset i don't expect everyone to be like that but i have seen a big difference in regards to work it work ethic in a lot of people and hopefully you know, those that are getting this downtime now, because I get how it is when the machine keeps turning. Uh, hopefully they're having an honest look in the mirror because that's the person you're accountable to. If you can look in the mirror and say, honestly, I'm giving it my all. I know I am. Things aren't working out. There's not much I can do about it, but I know in my heart I'm giving it my all. Then that's fine. But if you can't do that, then that's on you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to come next to uh, Hamza at Vulturehound. Hello, Drew. Hope you're doing well. Great, buddy. Uh, my question is, I mean, your journey like, back to WWE and to the championship is, uh, is well documented. And uh, it's also led to like legends like Mick Foley saying that, like, acknowledging that you proved, them ro you proved him wrong because he initially didn't see you as like a main event player in your first run. He thought you were just like 3MB was kind of the best for you, but he's admitted that you proved him wrong. Was that your motivation when, like, when you were released to prove people wrong? And what, and what is that like hearing Mick Foley kind of acknowledge like, get a, you proved, that you proved him wrong and that you belong in the main event? Yeah, I definitely initially. Um, I had a huge chip on my shoulder. Like, um, like up until we were fil filming my Chronicle, which is on the WWE Network, I had it in my head that, um, oh, yeah, I just hit the ground running. I was confident things worked out. It's, wasn't the case at all. Like uh, my wife reminded me as we were filming the Chronicle, you know, I was nervous, you know, I was like, oh my goodness, I've not had these long matches in a while. I've not had serious promos in a while because I was in 3MB. Um, but I do have this huge chip in my shoulder. I do believe in myself that much and I want to show the world what I'm capable of. And uh, Mick Foley was one of the first people that reached out to me after I did my mission statement promo in ICW. And he said to me, well, actually I reached out to him, tell a lie. And I sent out to him, <clears throat> if you get time, can you look at this, Mick? I always appreciate his opinion. Then he reached back out to me and said, like, my goodness, Drew, like, where was this guy? Um, and he took the time, which I found out not that long ago, to text Triple H and told him, you need to keep an eye on Drew McIntyre, Drew Galloway. You know, this uh, kid's got something. And at the time, he'd write about what he liked online and, and put a lot of people over. And he told me, I just want to do something bigger for you. He really believed in me that much, and he took the time and waited till he was on Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast and brought it up on there, which was really cool. And you know, I did Chris Jericho's podcast. He's someone else that I really believed in me, gave me that platform. But like you say, a lot of people saw what I had to say, and I basically said, you know, I'm going to become the biggest wrestler in the world, and ICW in Scotland, you know, is going to take over. And people probably thought that 3MB guy's lost his mind. Um, so it was a good feeling to work really hard and start changing those people's opinions and perceptions of me. And I got to the point where there was no chip in my shoulder. I was confident in myself. And if I went back to WWE, that's fantastic. I have some unfinished business. But if I didn't, I was genuinely having fun, you know, outside the company. And to hear some of the my peers uh, from 
you know, whatever part of the chain you want to look at all the way to the top, hear such positive things about, you know, my work ethic and the journey I've been on, you know, it does mean the world to me. We're going to come over to Dom Smith at Sounds Fair magazine. Hey guys, uh, thanks for thanks for having me. And uh, Drew, nice to spot, nice to speak to you today, mate. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I get to work with a lot of young people who struggle with mental health issues and have uh, poor self image and stuff. A lot of wrestling fans look up to people like yourself. Um, and I, they they struggle with success and what it means to them. You know, they think success needs to be uh, being a millionaire or being WWE champion or a success on YouTube or whatever. And I wanted to ask you what success means to you on a personal level as well as professionally, because obviously you've achieved a lot in WWE and around the world. Um, you know, I've come to realize uh, that success to me is just being happy. Um, you don't have to be WWE champion. If I, like I said, when I was outside the company, if I went back, that'd be nice. If I didn't, that's fine too. You know, I got to the point where I was just happy. Um, and I think that's it. Whatever makes you happy. Um, what other, other people think um, it's so easy for me to say and I'm not the person to speak on it but whatever like makes you happy you know my family make me happy my wife make me ha- makes me happy my cats make me happy if it's video games that make you happy if it's your family that make you happy if it's watching a certain television show that make you happy but if you're constantly chasing others opinions uh, of you you'll never be happy and again I'm not the person to speak on it that's just me personally that I know no matter what, if I'm WWE champion, without it, would I be happy? Absolutely. I've got everything that matters to me in the world. I've got family, I've got my wife, I've got my cats, and that's all I need. Absolutely. As an extension of that then, uh, obviously as we go into backlash, um, what things are motivating you? You mentioned your cats and your family, but specific sort of people, places, music, you you know, I'm a big uh, rock and metal fan, you know, uh, any music that you're listening to or any specific people and places that give you that motivation because there's a lot of people struggling at the moment for motivation so what is outside of wrestling and work what is motivating you um i listen to so many different kinds of music i think WWE have a playlist out right now uh, possibly on spotify or apples uh, or apple you'd have to, to google it but you'll see how wide my variety of music is i'll be listening to rock music one minute um especially 80s rock music more specifically then i'll have oasis and blur on the next minute then i'll have dance music on uh, the next minute, there's just so many different you know, pieces of music that will, you know, pick me up. And I guess on the, the subject, you know, mental health during this period, you know, I was never big on social media. Uh, aside for work purposes, you know, it is uh, as much of a great tool as it is. It is a dangerous tool. And I've really seen a change in people uh, when it comes to social media um, in certain areas. You know, I do see, um, you know, people struggling and they reach out online and people are going and helping them and lifting them up during these times. And, you know, people, uh, when the gyms are closed, are giving each other home workouts and they're really trying to lift each other up. So I have seen a lot of positivity on social media there. So it does exist. Um, and I guess, yeah, that, that's the kind of things that kind of kind of get me going. As a, some good music, some of my cats, the wife. Um, and actually seeing some positivity on there and each, everybody lifting each other up during difficult times. Got time for a couple more. So, uh, Gary, let's come back to you. Gary Casting. Excellent. Um, I had a little two-parter here that hopefully leads on a little bit from the last one, but ends on a nice note. Um, so we did speak about, you know, there's kind of two pandemics at the moment, if you will. There's a mental health one going on as well. Um, we've noticed that quite harshly in the wrestling world this past week you know the tragic passing of uh, Hannah Kimura even closer to WWE Alexa Bliss has had some pretty horrible comments this week what would you say if people out there that are either being bullied or doing the bullying Uh, I mean there are so many uh, you know scenarios and situations around the world that are incredibly upsetting Um, I don't think that Drew McIntyre is the person that should be speaking on it. Um, I think you should just ask yourself, you know, would I like it if somebody said that to me? You know, it's as simple as that. You know, it, it takes a lot of effort to not be nice and it doesn't take any effort to be nice. Just be nice. Excellent. That's the reason I asked that is obviously because you are, you mentioned it before, so close to your on-screen role and 
terms of your off-screen role of, and just who you are as a person. Leading on from that, the one person I wanted to ask you about um, was someone who opened up to the world shortly after being released, and it's Drake Maverick. Uh, what do you think about what's going on with him right now in his um, WWE journey? Yeah, it's the real uh, Drake Maverick. You know, that's the real spud. Um, he's very, very passionate about this industry, much like myself. He's, he's always wanted to do. He's gave his entire life to it. Um, and, you know, again, in the situation that he was in, he just put his heart in his sleeve and told the world, you know, I'm still going to keep doing this. He would, and he'd be successful wherever he went. But I th- he's so capable of multiple, multiple different roles not just in the ring like he's so talented when it comes to you know his mind he could be writing the show he could be helping with characters he can be on the show he can be a manager he's so multi-talented and i do think you know um going off of the storyline which he created himself you know he will be around and he's going to have a long future here and not just on camera but off camera too excellent thank you so much thank you Right, we've got time for one last question. So we'll come back to uh, Kenny. Kenny, go ahead. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, Drew, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier about Mick Foley, about the advice that he, you know, you showed him the promo and he gave you the advice. You've been back in WWE for like three years now. You've done so many different things. Are there one or two pivotal moments for you behind the scenes of kind of someone coming up to you and saying, you know, saying something that, that meant something to you, whether it's, you know, I didn't think you had that in you or welcome to the main event. or like, Was there any backstage moments that have kind of meant something to you in the run since you've come back? Yeah, there's been so many. Um, but, you know, when I was younger, I'd probably let them have got to my head a bit. I'd be like, damn right, I'm the man. You know, these days, if somebody that I respect or even people that are new um, have something nice to say, I just take it as, you know, that's really cool. And hopefully that just says I'm on the right path. Um, I wouldn't name names, but yeah, it has been from people just starting in the company all the way as high as you can go. I've heard positive things and I feel very you know, blessed because, you know, I've been up and down. I've been all around. If I could give any advice to anyone out there, you know, I was told this when I was younger. I didn't always listen to it. I tried to be, you know, a nice guy when I was younger, but I was, you know, a bit hard to deal with at times. But be nice to everybody on the way up. It's the same people on the way down. And once again, it takes effort to not be nice. Just be nice. I just don't understand anybody that doesn't think that way. And just lastly, I wanted to ask you about how, how hard was it for you to get a Tiger King reference in on Raw? <laughs> it wasn't hard at all. We were live. <laughs> My wife kind of dared me to. And uh, the truth is, I, she's not a big wrestling fan. Um, and I like that because she's my sounding board of what works for non-fans. Uh, How am I going to get the eyes on the product as the as the brand ambassador? And she's my sounding board. And we watched Tiger King. It was obviously the biggest thing, not just America, the world. And she kept saying, hey, all you cool cats and kittens. And I was like, what can I do? It's different outside the box. You know, I'm going to talk down the camera. That's how I'm going to reach people and connect with people. And I wish I was able to do it before, but now I've got free reign to do this. And she said, I dare you to save you know, hail you cool cats and kittens. And I went, okay, I absolutely will. I'm going to try things, see if it sticks. Maybe it'll get memed. Maybe someone on the internet and social media are not watching Raw. They see that, they go, what's going on on Raw? And they turn over. And that's kind of my mindset right now. And she does help a lot with that for, uh, you know, eyes outside of wrestling. Thanks. Thank you, bud. Well, thank you everyone so much for uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. I guess as a, as a final word, it should always go to Drew. So Drew, what I would say is it's been a, an incredible few weeks, uh, well, few months, but few weeks in particular. Um, so these guys that are here with us on the call have been a big part of supporting you in the UK, along with fans all around the country. So do you have anything to say to, to these guys and to UK fans in general about what this time has been like? I just want to thank you. I mean, you know, everybody on the call today, I recognize uh, all your names. I know some of y'all, I'm friends with some of y'all. Um, you've always had my back. Um, you know, prior to returning to WWE and uh, some new faces returning to WWE, and you're always saying such positive things. I appreciate you supporting me and supporting WWE um, in general, especially pushing us forward and getting stories out there during these times. For all the fans in the UK, I can't thank you all enough. Um, the fans are the reason I'm in this position right now. The fact that it's happened, me just being 
Drew Galloway is mental um, to me and the fact that people have latched onto my story. You know, I just, I guess, aspire to inspire these days and it's cool that's happening. So thank you, everybody. appreciate you all. Make sure you check out, you know, Raw and SmackDown NXT every week, of course, and uh, Backlash on June 14th because I guarantee what everyone thinks of Bobby Lashley and I right now, by June 14th, you're going to be very into it and you're going to see a heck, heck 